Hello, my name is Matthew Dillon, and I'm a senior research software engineer in the Caparezo lab. I'm one of the core Chime 2 developers. Greg just gave us a great overview of a lot of the more interesting bits of functionality for Chime 2, and we're going to get a chance over the next several days to really dive in and get a closer look at how a lot of this works by conducting a hands-on microbiome analysis using a tutorial data set. There are a few core concepts that we think are important to start thinking about now, uh, and these have to do with kind of the language of Chime 2 and the way that we think about data in Chime 2. So I'll start with an example. It's a little bit of a contrived example, but maybe everyone can, can relate. So imagine, sit down with your afternoon cup of coffee or tea and open up your email and just try and catch up on things and, and you get an email like this. It says, urgent analysis needed by Tuesday 2 p.m. And it looks like it's from my, my colleague, Evan Bolian. And it says, hi Matt, hope everything is going well with you. I was just wondering if you could analyze this data attached really quick. I need it by Tuesday at 2 p.m. There's a few files in here, but I just need you to check into the sample 11E by total one. So I look and I see there's a data.zip attachment and I unzip it and I open up sample 11E by total and I see something that looks like this, this matrix of numbers. There appears to be a couple of uh, things that maybe look like labels here, A, B, and C, and S1, S2, and S3, but there's no description anywhere in this email about what Evan has provided to me. Not only that, but there's also no explanation really here of what Evan needs. All we know is that he wants us to analyze this data and he needs it by Tuesday at 2 p.m. So I think it's safe to say we are missing important context here. We don't really know what he wants us to do and we don't really know what the nature of this, this data, this matrix or this table represents. So I've got a couple of potential scenarios here. Uh, these are, are different options that we could take to move forward. Um, and I want us to think about some of the impacts of that missing context in Evan's email. So the first scenario is I could just take that, that table, that matrix, and try and do something with it. Attempt to run some kind of analysis. Maybe I work in a microbiome lab and I know that there are certain kinds of analyses that we, we tend to do, for example. But um, because I don't know what Evan has done to generate that data, and I don't know what that data represents, I might do the wrong thing. And so the outcome, or the potential negative outcome here, is that I derive incorrect conclusions. So I might run some analysis, that I think is right, turns out has some fundamental flaw, and then I send the results back to Evan and we publish the wrong wrong data, or we make a, a uh, potentially costly incorrect conclusion out of it. Another scenario here, I could look at Evan's email and say, well, this guy, he's asking way too much and has not given me any information um, so I'm going to go back to him and say, hey, Evan, I need more details. I need that missing context. The risk here is that we missed that deadline. He made it very clear that we had a limited amount of time to do this, this work. And if I have to have a back and forth discussion with Evan several times, um, you know, kind of checking to make sure that I understand something or asking for clarification, we could miss that deadline. Another scenario that we could run into is um, a little bit more subtle, but we could do what we usually do with these data. So imagine that I have been working um, working in, with this group for years and we have a very kind of well-established pipeline um, for running whatever kinds of data it is that we run. And so I just do my normal thing. 
the the risk here is that we might not necessarily be using the latest techniques available to us because we don't necessarily know all of the details about these data. Okay, so a common aspect to all of this is that we're kind of um, talking about context in, in terms of this, this email conversation. But now I want us to shift our focus and think about context with respect to a computer. I have a, uh, a minor complaint here about how um, we often think about and talk about computers in the sciences. I think oftentimes we imbue this almost um, godlike power in computers, that somehow a computer is all-knowing or is capable of understanding what, what it is that you want to do without you even telling the computer. Um, so I've got this, this still of, uh, of some, you know, kind of oracle-like um, computer type creature here from one of the Matrix movies. And this, this bothers me because I think computers are a really great tool, but I think they're only as good as, as we are, the people that program it or the people that are using it. So another way to put this is computers are not clever. They will only do exactly as they are instructed. Um, they can't read between the lines. They can't infer things about uh, what it is that you want to do or what it is that you're after. So with all of this in mind, I want to pose this question. What kinds of opportunities are created when we're able to provide more context to a computer? Um, and Let's kind of think about this first in terms of this email example. So if we revisit these scenarios that we were looking at a few moments ago, that first scenario where we potentially do the wrong thing and generate incorrect conclusions, well, if we had more context from Evan there, um, then we could have been prevented from providing the wrong input to the command. That would have been really great if um, if we were able to somehow know, okay, this data does not satisfy some critical assumption of this, this analysis that I was about to run. For the second scenario, the one where potentially missed the deadline, um, the advantage of that additional context there is that we would, uh, would not have to go somewhere else to find the context. The contextual data is somehow uh, already encoded within that, that message or within that, that email. So the idea here is we have a complete file of everything, so to speak. And in the third scenario, with additional context um, available to us, uh, this one's a little bit more of a, um, a hypothetical, but this is a, this is a long-term goal um, in, in our, our eyes. But being able to ask a search engine, not just like what what should I do with this data or you know run run some type of uh, analysis, but to be able to actually ask like what can I do with this type of data sounds really, really interesting to me. Being able to search in some big global search engine or database and and learn about all the different types of analyses that I could conduct with some some type of data. That sounds pretty exciting to me. Okay, so with all of that set up, uh, I imagine you're all kind of anticipating now that I'm going to uh, show you how this relates to Chime 2, and, and that is exactly the case. So Chime 2 attempts to encode um, useful context within uh, some related related concepts uh, in the in the framework and within the ecosystem. So we're going to look at these two things one after the other. So again, the the title of my talk here was about semantic types and formats. So th let's start with semantic types. So what this means here, the term semantic types, it's it's the vocabulary for describing what data quote, is. 
So what I mean by that is the uh, the semantics of the data uh, refer to the the meaning or the the concept of the data. So when when we talk about, for example, uh, like a phylogenetic tree, we're not necessarily talking about some tree that is sitting somewhere, maybe in someone's garden, with uh, labels about the the various species or, or whatnot um, on this tree. We're talking about the, the concept of a phylogenetic tree. It's not something that you can hold in your hand, um, but it is a, a concrete conceptual idea. And so with these semantic types, the idea here is that it's, it's a language in which we can talk about different types of uh, microbiome bioinformatics data. So I've got a few boxes here on my screen, and these all represent different types or common types of semantic types represented within a Chime 2 uh, environment. So these are things like a feature table of frequency, or a phylogeny, or a sample data of sequences with quality, or a feature data of taxonomy. Now, if none of those, those words mean anything to you, if you don't know what taxonomy is, or if you've never heard of a feature table, that's fine. That's the point of this workshop. We're going to start to introduce these concepts uh, over the next few days, and we'll, we'll revisit this. But maybe some of you in the audience are familiar with these concepts, like you've received, say, sequencing product from, from your sequencing center. You, you might recognize then that this semantic type here, sample data of sequences with quality, well, that, that describes that, that data that you've received from, from your sequencing center. So here's the other side to the coin, data formats. Uh, so semantic types refer to the meaning. Data formats refer to the way that data is represented. So what it looks like in a file or what it looks like in a computer program, how it is actually laid out. Um, so the important thing to keep in mind here is that semantic types keep the formatting separate from the meaning of the data. So we treat these as two separate things. So I've overlaid a few uh, boxes here over my list of semantic types to highlight a few possible formats that could be used to represent data of that semantic type. So for the first one here, this yellow one, it was a feature table of frequency, we could represent these data as a biome file or perhaps a TSV that stands for tab separated values. That's like a spreadsheet um, or a CSV. It's a comma separated values file similar to a TSV or perhaps it could be a pandas data frame or an R data frame or, or something. As well, um, here for the sample data uh, of sequences with quality, we have the possibility of representing this data as a FASTQ file or maybe as a FASTA plus qual file. There is no, no reason why one is necessarily better than the other, but the point is, is that different types of data can be, or one type of data more specifically, can be represented with multiple different formats or, or representations. There's also an interesting um, uh, observation to highlight here as well. So you might notice that um, this feature table frequency and the feature table taxonomy down at the bottom both have many of the same formats listed here. So biome, TSV, CSV, or data frame. And then down here over the feature data of taxonomy, we have TSV, CSV, pandas data frame. You notice many of those in those two lists overlap. They're the same. And so I think the important thing to, to realize when you see that is this means that if I give you a TSV file, you can't just immediately look at that and know, well, yes, that represents taxonomy data, or that represents a feature table. The point is, the semantic type is that context that helps identify what the contents of that file actually are. 
So another really nice advantage to separating out the semantic meaning from the data representation is that formats can change over time while the semantics remain the same. So I have a, a figure over here on the right of several uh, tools. Semantic type of these tools, if I was to come up with a name for this, is I would call these hand tools for woodcutting. Um, and so that's listed down here in the bottom left in this blue blue box. And the, the intent or the meaning of uh, the semantic type is that these, these represent a class of tools that are specifically used for cutting wood. And you'll notice this has nothing to do with programming, nothing to do with microbiome bioinformatics. Now in the figure, you see a sequence of five different tools. Now, all of these tools represent a different format or a different representation of a woodcutting hand tool, um, but they are all different. So there's this nice kind of evolution here from a primitive stone axe to a bronze axe to a modern axe to a crosscut saw. And then finally over here on the right is a gas powered chainsaw. The idea that formats can change over time is, uh, I think it's an important one. We learn more about how to represent data or how best we can, um, say, shrink file size or increase uh, um, the utility of a different format. And so this is a really nice side effect of separating out the semantic meaning, hand tool for woodcutting, from the format these various ways in which to do it. This also allows us to guarantee backwards compatibility. So results generated today in Chime 2 will be backwards compatible with uh, future versions of um, um, Chime 2, or more specifically, those future versions will be backwards compatible with results generated today. So. The last point that I want to emphasize here is that there is no one right way to do a Chime 2 analysis. This is something that comes up every now and then. People want to kind of like abstractly talk about a Chime 2 pipeline. Um, and this is, um, is maybe not the, the, the mindset that, that will get you the most utility out of using Chime 2. What I mean by that is Chime 2 is the model for Chime 2 and for the architecture of the whole thing is to provide a series of small modular uh, functions or, or commands that can be composed together in some sequence or some order that is most relevant or appropriate for you and your analysis. So how commands work in Chime 2 at a very high level is like this. Uh, black, the black box in the middle here represents some kind of Chime 2 command. We'll call this a Chime 2 action. And we talk about the inputs or the things that need to be provided to this action by using semantic types. And then the things that are returned from that action, we talk about those by using Chime 2 semantic types. So we say this action takes semantic types of a certain type and returns outputs of some semantic type. The idea then is by using this language of the semantic types, we can start to glue more and more of these actions together. Now, another thing that you might be wondering about with all this discussion of semantic types and formats is, how does the data actually work in Chime 2? Where does my data go? How, what does Chime 2 do with it? And this is where um, something pretty, uh, pretty exciting comes into play here. So we have two different file types that we work with, and um, we'll, we'll talk a lot more about these in, in the coming days. But basically, Chime 2 is able to generate two um, to kind of high level outputs, either artifacts or visualizations. Artifacts refer to data and visualizations refer to something that we should be able to kind of look at or interpret. The um, 
kind of interesting idea here, and we'll, we'll get we'll get some examples of it as we get into the tutorial, is that artifacts are used as inputs and outputs um, for, for various Chime 2 actions, while visualizations represent a terminal output. So a command that generates a visualization is kind of the end of a branch of some part of your analysis. So a question that often comes up then is people want to know, well, where did my FASTA file go? Or where did my biome file go? Um, when they see their, their chime zipped artifact. And the, the kind of exciting thing here for me is that it's, it's just inside a zip file. Um, we aren't inventing any kind of new formats. Um, all we do is we zip all the files up as Chime 2 saves them. And so then this, this allows us to do a lot of um, pretty interesting things. If you're curious about learning more about the sort of specification design of this, there's a, a link here to our developer docs that you can, um, can look at. But kind of the most interesting thing uh, in terms of long-term archival storage is because these are just zip files, even if Chime 2 goes away and, and uh, doesn't exist anymore, these files can be opened with any, um, any modern zip implementation. Uh, you might have to, for example, change the extension from .qza to .qzv, but they are accessible that way. So the next question that, that we usually get is like, well, why zip the files? Why not just save, save the, the FASTA or save the, the biome file? The reason is because Chime 2 saves all of that context that we were talking about at the start of my talk. And that's what is represented here in this figure. The point is there is a lot going on here in order for Chime 2 to be able to keep track of things like decentralized provenance or information about what version of Chime 2 generated this, this particular output. So all of these boxes in here represent either a directory in the zip file or a file within the zip file. And most of this has to do with that context that we were talking about earlier. Only this tiny little section down at the bottom with these yellow boxes actually represent the data. So this is why. This is why we have QZAs and QZVs. And we will review this uh, many more times over the coming days. And um, we will also uh, answer any questions as, as you kind of let this sit and, and you think about this. Um, feel free to ask questions at, at any point, and we will uh, gladly discuss. With that, thank you very much, and I will see you later.